recording is on. All right, so today's April 4th, 2021. Uh, we have a special Easter special, and we have uh, Lear Keith again as our guest. And we'll continue from our conversation last week. Um, do you remember how, I think Hugh, you, you had something or you were continuing on, on an idea last week, right? Yeah, we'll get back to that. It's basically our project and our plan oh. for, you know, a, a basically last ditch attempt, I think, in terms of, you know, trying mass psychology as, as a psyops. So that's what we're trying to do. But uh, I wanted to just talk a bit more about geoengineering and the reason why I think we were kind of, uh, you know, the last ditch Hail Mary attempts to actually do something because I think that people are starting to take geoengineering seriously now. I just posted something from the uh, Indian uh, Minister of Energy and, and basically they're calling to say that, well, it's, you know, the rich countries should not only do carbon mitigation, they should, you know, start drawing carbon out of the atmosphere and stuff, which is clear indication to me they're starting to manufacture consent for, for geoengineering. I wonder if you've heard of a, a guy called uh, David Keith. I hope he's no relation. No. <laughs> um, I don't know who he is. He's definitely not a relation. So what is, what is, is he going to put aerosols up or move the planet? Yeah. Or what's his... yeah, he's been on this for, on this trip for a long time. He's a Harvard uh, professor um, and he's been calling for geoengineering for decades. Um, he did a TED talk in about 2013 where you know, everybody gasped <laughs> at what he's proposing. But now um, there's been a shift in more in, in his direction, and particularly in sulfates, because sulfates are so cheap and dirty. Um, they're inexpensive and quick. And so people are starting to talk in terms of actually using them. Uh, but what's, what's amazing out of that 2013 talk is that he mentions this report uh, 50 years ago that went to Lyndon Johnson about the dangers of climate change. And what they, they said to him then was, you know, basically everything that's happened now that we would get to you know, 350 and then 400 parts per million in CO2. And that, they were very accurate on how much warming that would cause. But what's amazing about that paper was, or that report to him was that straight out the gate, they didn't talk about mitigation. They said it's a serious, serious threat, but they thought immediately of geoengineering solutions. From So from 1965, the report was, the, their first thought, their last thought was, was geoengineering. And, you know, fast forward all, all the way to today, I mean, all these uh, billionaires from Bill Gates, to Richard Branson, they they've all been funding these these things for sulfates, uh, you, you know, because uh, they just so easy and they've been proven by volcanoes, volcanic ash, you know, the uh, Pinatabu um, eruption, you know, significantly cooled the earth, and so they feel that it's it's safe to do, but the consequences of it is acid rain. And I think it's the craziest thing known to man because they're going to put, uh, you know, sulfates into the ocean. They're going to turn, change the pH of the world ocean. And that's going to have a devastating effect on everything down to, you know, cyanobacteria. If, they, yeah. if the calcium is going to leach out of, you know, microorganisms and they provide the oxygen. So they're going to be, you know, they'll be putting our oxygen at risk if they're not, if they're not careful. But I mean, it's, it's, it's so crazy. It's, beyond belief and it's it's starting to get traction i feel so uh, you know i'm alarmed and I, I think you know this <laughs> this is this is a 500 alarm alarm bell yeah. fire alarm bell call to say that we, we've got to stop these idiots it's just unbelievable but I'll, I'll let you comment it's the same kind of hubris that got us into this position in the first place i'm, I'm i just i don't even know what to say like have they not read the story of Icarus? Did they skip that day in school? It's, you're gonna crash and burn. And also, why do these tiny little slice of human, like, you know, there's like 50 of them up there making these decisions for the, the rest of life, not even all the humans, but everything. 
if we put this to a vote, there's no way that every creature on the planet would vote to do something this ridiculous with our climate, this risky. Like, where's the precautionary principle in all of this? Yeah, there have been, you know, volcanoes that exploded and changed the climate. And sometimes it was so bad that 90% of life on Earth died because the Earth got so cold so quickly and there wasn't enough sunlight. So why does anybody think this is something we should even be attempting to do? These systems are so complex. Well, I, it's well, the level that, that like, they, they just think they can understand it all and then somehow do what they want and they can't it's not possible for us to understand what what the consequences would be and it would be so devastating like the risk is so huge why would you even let this how does this even cross their minds like i'm just well, it just blows me away so so i've long thought that that you know the whole situation of eco destruction is, is a psychological problem and the yeah. fundamental reason why i think geoengineering shouldn't be done is you shouldn't be trying a geoengineering fix for a psychological problem right it's fundamentally flawed before yeah. you even lift the starting blocks but it's um they they there are two things that are interesting about it one of them is that they know that they don't understand the system uh, so they, they don't pretend that they know what they're doing is the first remarkable thing. The second remarkable thing you said about them not letting us know or we don't have a say in one of the most important things that will happen in, to our species um, is that they know very well that 80% of the population is against geoengineering. So they're going ahead in stealth. They're just using the raw power and stealth. Um, and they have such tremendous power that I think it's beyond, you know, just saying doing a big expose. By the time you do an expose, um, they they will be too far down the road in the big psyops where they will convince the population. They, they can just terrorize the population into doing it. I mean, they just have to say, oh, so climate change is way worse than we said. The Arctic is collapsing. We've got to do something now. And that 80% of people will flip to saying, yes, <laughs> do something. Yeah. So we we're, we're in the deep, uh, psychological territory, and I think the the way to attack it is with the psyops. That's traditionally, you know, psychological operations have been done for a long time in the military, and and I think that's where we are now. What do you think? Well, they control the the mass media, so I mean, they could roll out these stories to make everybody get on board. I remember years ago talking to somebody who sort of a strange little coincidence, but she actually was a, um, she was a woodworker and she made violins, which is very specialized clearly. And she had gone to this master class about making violins and there was somebody else there who, for fun, this is what he did on the side to, you know, stress relief from his job. And he ran the second largest PR and advertising firm in the world. So it was just, I mean, just massive amounts of control over people's lives. And what he said, almost laughingly, was that everybody in, in the industry knows you can tell people one thing and then within 30 days, you can tell them the complete opposite and they'll believe it. Um, so it's not a lot of time has to pass between the one statement and the next. And you can get everybody pretty much on board if you let enough time go by. And that's not a very long amount of time, but they know how to do it. This, you know, billions of dollars go into this every year. They know exactly how to make people agree to things, to, you know, buy things, to change their behavior, to whatever, you know, crazy new technologies coming along. Um, so that's what scares me. It's just, I think if the powers that be want to do this, they know how and they have the money to do it. I don't know from our end, what can we fight this with? I so there's, <laughs> I've been trying to convince people of this for a long time. I've, I've had uh, a windfall recently because there's been a success in exactly what I've been trying to do and that's what we mentioned last time with the Quebec Alpha November Oscar November cult. <laughs> uh, they, they are doing a massive psyops. Now the thing about psyops and it was successful it almost brought down the US government so it's you know it's about as successful as you can that it could reach China and places that are inaccessible to normal protest and activism. But the the thing about um, that kind of SOPS is, in essence, what SOPS is trying to do, it, it uses 
consonants and dissonance. So what you were talking about there was was consonants. You can get people together to believe in one thing. Eddie Bernays, for example, um, sold cigarettes to women. Women didn't used to smoke before the twenties, but he did it by saying, "Well, there was a big push for the suffrage, suffragettes and freedom." And so he said, "Well, he got." this advertising campaign and got it into life magazine got all these women smoking cigarettes and said you know oh they freedom torches and it was obviously phallic you know it was he was using his uncle freud's you know thing and basically they almost coca-cola took that kind of graphic um you know semi-erotic stuff but anyway all the women there with you know these cigarettes in their mouths very phallic and stuff and it caught on hugely and made it you know, women since then have smoked. He was responsible for 50% of the population smoking, which didn't, and the countless deaths that must have come from that. Now, that's consonant. It means getting people together in, for a common goal. So the, uh, the other part of that uh, that SIOPS does is dissonance. So what normally happens is the U.S. State Department comes in, they try and bolster the, the narrative that supports, uh, you know, America and capitalism. And then they try and create dissonance in the narrative or the counter narrative. Now, it seems to me that if uh, in this situation, all you need is dissonance. Dissonance is easy. It's consonance is, is, is difficult. It's hard to get people together to believe a narrative. It takes a lot of resources. But dissonance is easy, and that's pretty much what um, the Q crowd did. Was right. it's, it's, it's kind of like you know destruction and entropy. It's easier to destroy stuff than it is to build stuff. So you have to build consonants, but dissonance you just have to destroy. So it's kind of uh, easy to break down, and it could be done... You know, it, it has been done, you know, um, with the Q crowd. But what do you think? Yeah, I mean, they did it. And 4chan does a lot of that, too. And, I mean, God knows we can see the influence they have across the culture here, certainly. How do you think we could do it? Like, it sounds like you have a plan. So what do you think would work? How many of us would be needed and what would they be doing? So like, in theory, I, I, yes. I mean, we've seen in, in living color how they've been able to do this. So how would we use distance? So the you can't have a master plan. You just have to feel your way. But the way forward, I think, is you start small with a small crystallized group. And essentially, it's it's a cult. It's, it's really what you're creating is a cult. You, uh, Q is a cult. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I just made a video, so if you can, if you <laughs> prepare to waste three and a half hours of your life, I critiqued a video. Three and a half hours, that's a long video. I, I, I couldn't help it because, because it's a critique of a TED talk. Okay. Uh, and the TED talk was about dismantling uh, these Quebec guys. Mm -hmm. um, Quebec being, you know, cipher. <laughs> so. You have to watch out for the keywords a bit. So the um, the so the TED talk was was very very instructive because in explaining what the phenomena was and how to tear it down with these culty programmers. One of the um, one of them is uh, Stephen uh, Hazen, and he's one of the the uh, prime uh, mind control and cult experts in the world. And so they were discussing how do they get rid of of, <laughs> of this organ, of this cult. In doing so, they gave a perfect how-to manual <laughs> on, in advertisement on how to actually do it. Which so I thought it was so remarkable that I I you know uh, made commentary out of it and critiqued it as I went. Unfortunately, it was about two hours, so to <laughs> to critique it made it. <laughs> Well, about, it's yeah. intriguing. I'm definitely intrigued. Well, send, um, send me a link. Where do I find it? I will definitely take a yeah, look. Yeah, we'll send you a link. I'll post a link to when we put this video up, this recording of this interview up on YouTube. I'll post a link to it too. But yeah, it's um, it's it's uh, it comes from alternate reality gaming. So one of the guys on it was he claims he started alternate reality gaming. It's not really true, <laughs> but. But what, what I've been trying to do is PSYOPs through alternate reality games since 2012. 
uh, where I realized the situation was really far gone. <laughs> and so um, I, I've been working on it. They were well funded. They were well, I mean, they had $4 million out the gate. So it's, so yeah, they're basically, this is uh, big operations. <laughs> um, uh, but they really, what started it was disaffected people in the military. So the military, all these alphabet soup organizations have been doing this all over the world. And this is a case where the war comes home, you know, where, you know when these guys come back from Iraq and stuff, they disaffected. And when they leave the military, they highly trained in all these subversive techniques and science. And what they're doing now is using them against the civilian population. And that's that's what's uh, curious. But there's no reason why other people can't <laughs> do it as well. The same thing. And, and in effect, yeah, in effect, they're working towards the same goal. If you if you get over the politics and all the wacky mm -hmm. stuff, um, it, it really is just to uh, dismantle the institutions that are destroying this planet. So it's, um, yeah, it has huge potential. And uh, yeah, if you want to know the nuts and bolts of, of how to do it, um, it, it is all explained. I, I could explain it in less length, but alternative reality gaming is, is in essence uh, a powerful format that people found um, it came from a number of strands. There was Ong's hat and I love I love bees with the halo. It was used for commercial advertising and stuff. But what people found was if you make a cult atmosphere, people get absorbed in the narrative. You, people work from a narrative story. And it's almost the, the, the crazier the story, the better. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's really creating a religion. It's the same thing that say Christians, uh, early Christians are just a cult. And, and People say, well, why, how did Christianity get off the ground? It's such a wacky story. But they don't realize the psychology of it is the wackier, the better. The, the more it creates bonding in an in-group. It's kind of like a test, you know. Sure. So you're using all these techniques um, and basically just, and in essence, then you have to ask yourself, is this moral? And the moral question is, you, essentially, you're making Manchurian candidates that will basically save the planet. <laughs> but I'll let you talk. I mean, I, I think we have to do everything we can at this point. I, the situation is so desperate. It's so desperate. And I mean, we're out here writing books and trying to get people to think a little bit about how maybe solar and wind aren't actually going to save us. And even that, we've gotten so much pushback. So I, don't, I mean, I'm open to hearing anything. So I'm absolutely intrigued by what, you know, where you're going with this. I don't know if we have the people to do it, but... I, might be worth a try. Well, the thing is, I don't. I don't think you look for results and look for <laughs> a grand success. You just, you know, move forward in right. in that direction and just, you know, take opportunities as you can. You just, you know, opportunistic um, and take take things one step at a time. But yeah, um, I certainly. I'm convinced of the power of it. I mean, it's it's stunning. <laughs> the the um, what's what's difficult about it is that people want to know how it works. You know how alternative reality gaming works, and they want to understand it first. But by definition, it's designed that you can't understand it. That's its strength, and that's the power of uh, of of these psyops. So. They were done in Russia. The Russians took what America started, especially in the 50s, um, and the, the Russians uh, call it active measures. And they developed it. There's a guy called Sarkov, and he, um, he essentially made Putin. <laughs> uh, but Putin runs PSYOPs all, all the time against us and against Crimea and people in Russia too. What's interesting about Sarkov was he would, you know, get these far right and far left organizations, neo Nazis and things, um, and then he would say publicly that he was funding both, which would just blow people's minds. <laughs> And it's a deliberate and calculated thing so that people cannot make head or tail of it. It's just, right. it's, no, but it makes total sense. Yeah. You've got both extremes. Like, who else is going to just wreck everything? That's if that's what you're after. Of course, that'll do it. 
but but then but then it's a genius move. Yeah, it if is. You don't Absolutely. say that that's, a, that's what you're actually doing. Then people's heads yeah. explode. I mean, I've the idea is that they don't know what here. to believe. Go ahead. Go ahead. The idea is so that they they have they don't know who to yeah. believe. It's uh, you know, and it's perfect for like a post-truth world. Yeah. So what? I think that we've been doing, and ecologists in general have been trying to reason with people and that are completely unreasonable. <laughs> yeah. And you you can go only go so far. At some point, you have to say, well, maybe it's better to switch and not try and reason them. Just just completely confuse their own reasoning, yeah. so that you destroy the narrative for say wind farms and solar panels instead of reasoning with people and saying they're not going to work. You just uh, make the dialogue. <laughs> you know, you need a narrative, and you, to say you need a green, green New Deal and stuff, you need a narrative and a consensus, and they're good at drawing the consensus and manufacturing Greta to support it. And uh, But you can almost, uh, it's more, uh, it's easier to actually just dissemble the narrative so that people don't know whether, <laughs> uh, whether you know, energy transition is possible. And so, you know, they just can't get a consensus for it and then it just doesn't happen. <laughs> right, right. Well, I mean, here, the, the Q people have been so successful that, I mean, I've seen so many people who are kind of in my sort of outer social world who are into all kinds of radical politics and you would think would be stable, dependable people. And it's gotten them. I mean, they really believe most of it. And you're just going, well, how, how did this happen to you? Um, so it's from the, they've managed to get both the right and the left to go kind of crazy on this. Um, and in fact, there were quite a number of people when they do the polling who would have been Bernie Sanders voters who voted for Trump. So it made that total horseshoe theory. It was, is there, you know, like they, they did that. Whoever they are, they, they did that. Um, oh my God, you mentioned the horseshoe theory. Yeah. Every, every time I mention the horseshoe theory, uh, well, people on the right don't mind it so much, but people on the left, they, their head explodes. They hate the horseshoe it. theory. You see people who do it. Well, like, it happens before your eyes. Like, no, they just went total horseshoe. Like, I've I, seen it now. That's what that's I say. Happened. And people, people say, no, I, it's, it's completely wrong. I say, you just saw it before your eyes. Yeah. You can yeah, see just, the horseshoe theory. It's just millions of people have done that now. So I don't. Yeah. So no, it's, it's quite real. Thing. But but here's the thing: uh, an important part of alternate reality games and the stuff that people have been doing is this concept called game jacking, or movement jacking. So what it's uh, it turns into is movements are fairly easy to movement jack. It's it's happened to occupiers, happened <laughs> to extinction rebellion. That this not movement jacking is not quite infiltration, right? It's it's basically getting involved in the organization and then subtly steering it away. Mm -hmm. So what it results in is a competition for who's going to control the narrative. Whoever controls the narrative controls the movement, and so it becomes a very zen-like game of chess, trying to steal them. <laughs> where who's going to herd the sheep? But at the end of the day, if you like me and I think like you and we just I think of myself as an accelerationist all we have to do is to stop the madness of the civilization all these people are trying to get a narrative together that essentially saves civilization and we're right. saying no we're just trying to accelerate its collapse yeah. so that there's something yep. left afterwards yep so yeah. so so in in essence we have a following win so I <laughs> They have the much, much harder time. And plus, plus the game, the the approach with the game is absolutely like a defense from any type of attacks, because you're just we're just doing a game. We're just, you know, we've often talked about this. Well, I think it's for for the time for the times. It's made for the times for a number of reasons. If you take, for instance, what's happening now in the UK, the, the policing bill that's going through, they, they're not going to kill the bill. That's going to go through. That's the, that's the end of street protest and the form of NVDA that XR was doing. Right. Uh, so that effe effectively, that's the, the end of traditional 
civil rights type protest in that format like Occupy. Uh, you can't blockade anything. They'll, they'll put you in jail for 10 years now. So, so then I, I think that's a good thing. I think it's a blessing in disguise because most kids are completely lost in the matrix online. They're all in cyberspace. Yeah. So the and essentially the state owns the street. They've staked it out. They've prepared so well for you know coming unrest in the street, mob violence in the street, that essentially you just have to cede that territory to them and move into cyberspace. In cyberspace, they're not nearly well prepared and staked out. There, the the law is not there. The mechanisms are not there. The only actors there are state agencies that have to maintain a low profile and and you know. Um, uh, they can't expose themselves too heavily, which is vulnerable for them. You know, they can't come out in the open like a police force. They, they things like the NSA and stuff, which have have to. Um, they, they've got more to lose by exposure than than anybody else. So, so they can't come out and fight directly. So it means that cyberspace is really open for contention, and the vast number of kids are on their couches as slacktivists, and that. Is where they want to be. They they game. The the boys are gamers, and the the girls are on social media, and so that they're accessible there, and that's where the the battleground is. If you and then it, where it turns into the real world again, is things like if you just look at, you know, this ever given story, right? In the sewers is basically well. There's this. There's a fair chance. <laughs> There's not a zero chance that that's not a kind of a Stuxnet operation. So it, it, the story unfolds, but there are a number of things. I think the latest thing I've seen that there was this little bit of a blackout <laughs> on the ship, which is very suspicious. But it, it gives you an idea. Of what, what do you think? What, what you think you can do. EMP, or do you think a cyber attack, EMP attack? Or? Have you got no, any? It was, it was, Stuxnet was Stuxnet was uh, U.S. Israeli attack on the Iranian um, centrifuges. The they were basically making um, nuclear weapons. So what they did was they spun they 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 get in a little thumb drive, chuck it over the fence in, in one of these nuclear research facilities. Somebody sticks it in a computer, and that's it. The whole network is infected, even though it's isolated uh, what they did was they spun up the the centrifuges I, I I suspect what they you know it's it's SCADA um, it's standard control protocol um, for machines around the world so they they got in the SCADA net and I it's they didn't completely reveal what they did but what I suspect they did was they spun them up with harmonic oscillations to, and, and basically essentially kind of walls of Jericho thing where you make different modes of vibration until you can bring them down. But they caused tremendous damage. And that's just controlling the speed of the centrifuge. <laughs> so it was just a little computer virus. But um, there, there's so many groups <clears throat> that are doing this kind of thing um, that it's, uh, you know, you, you just need a coherent narrative um, yeah. But <laughs> are you stunned into silence? No, I I just I I'm with you completely. I think it's absolutely worth trying. Um I don't spend enough time on this online stuff to even know where to begin. But if I mean if there's people out there like you who want to do it, I I'm all, I you have my total blessing. And I, I do find it fascinating. So you know, whatever one you want to tell me about uh, how you might do it, I, I'm all ears. I just uh, we got to try everything. I mean, we just we have yeah. to try everything. So, and I do. I've always been intrigued by who gets to form the narrative and how they do it. That is something that my entire life has intrigued me. It's why every year, where every four years when we have the presidential election, I always watch the Democrat and the Republican, the national conventions because they're rolling out their stories. You know. And it's like, how are they making this believable? Who is, who are they hooking here, and how? Because you know, every single word is planned. So, how? What's the story they're telling, and is this going to be compelling? And to who, and and why? And I just have always found that so fascinating. So this is like a whole other level of it. But I, I get it. Like it is very, very intriguing. 
because we're storytelling animals. So there is something, yeah. our brains just naturally want the story. So I get it that like, if you can just, you know, break it enough, then another story is there waiting. People will grab it. Like we've seen this with QAnon. We've seen this with all the crazy stuff. It didn't take much and they were all in. So how, I mean, how could this be used in defense of the planet? I'm. Well, it's it's who whoever it's wins the battle for the the narrative is whoever has the most coherent narrative. Mm -hmm. So, it doesn't. You see, it, it's a mistake to think in terms of whoever has the truth or something like right. that. It's like the truth right. doesn't matter at all. No. It's mm -hmm. just you you can you know fairies and goblins and <laughs> extraterrestrial beings. As long as your narrative fits the human psyche better it wins. So it's it's got nothing to do, it's who's got the most appealing story. So uh, it really means that you have to understand psychology well and stuff. And it, it doesn't, it's not technical expertise, it's the kind of expertise that, <laughs> that you and Derek have in space. <laughs> and that's understanding the planet and the psychology. Um, so, and be, be, it's really people like you because it, you know you are narrative story weavers so but i think in the past people have been saying we must tell the truth <laughs> exposed to me saying no forget the truth <laughs> you gotta you know it's more important to save the planet than tell the truth it's like what if we 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 told the absolute truth we said the emperor had no clothes and we're like, yay, you get a gold star for telling the truth, but like the, the emperor has just destroyed the planet. It's like, right. rather tell a story that brings the emperor down, even though it's untrue, is is the way the way to go. So, so the example is it, it really, to put it mildly, is you just go for the basal layers, you know, the brain. <laughs> it's just the deeper the psyche is what you go for. for so, for example. Um, uh, you you raised how they got how they start this message and get it going. Well, take for instance something like you know gay marriage. Mm -hmm. Now everybody, gay marriage is such a big deal in the politics and stuff now, but people don't know the origins of it. And as far as I know, <laughs> I mean, fact check me on this one. But as far as I know, it was running up to the two thousand and eight election, maybe the parliamentary one in two thousand six. But it was. I think it was 2006, maybe. And I think it was Lutz. Who's the guy, um, Bush's guy, uh, who did all the dirty tricks? He was he was famous for doing dirty tricks for... Um, oh, yeah, he was like the power behind the throne. Oh, God, I can see his face. Is it, is it Lutz or something? Lutz? No. Um, no, that's not it. Um, oh, God, I can see him. What was his name? Yeah, I, I can, I I can see talking. him, too. It's oh, like, I'm going to Google. This is going to drive me nuts. Cheney, Vice President Cheney. No, no, did the not, guy who did his dirty tricks campaign. Cheney was part of it, but there was another guy too. Uh, it, it, it was a guy who he went through as Bush's campaign manager for. Yeah, it was kind of like Jeff Starr, but it was. Um, I Kenneth Starr. Frank, Frank Lutz. Well, no, what was it? No, no. Kenneth Starr. No, Kenneth Starr. Ken, Ken Starr wasn't the one. It, he was Ken in Starr on it. was was the attorney that yeah, tried to get yeah. Clinton. Oh, what was the name of that guy? He's probably dead now. I can see his face. George Schultz? No. Hey, George Schultz. Schultz? No. No. George Schultz. I don't know. Yeah, he was in the administration too, but he's not the one that was. Not the one. Of. Oh, it'll come to us. I'm, I'm going to keep. Oh, well, well anyway, you, you know the guy, but I, I think. It is, um, I think it was him. And what, what he did was he just did um, focus groups. Mm -hmm. And he got all these contentious things to manipulate conservatives and got all these trigger issues. And they came up with this idea. Where they said, like, you know, what about gay people getting married? And they got a reaction off the charts. So they found the polling, you know, blue yeah. conservatives' minds getting something. And what they did was they say you take something really sacred and, you know, close to the heart, like marriage. And then you get something which is really a hot button issue for conservatives, like, you know, being gay. And you, you put the two together, it was like nitroglycerine. So what they did was they started 
having they started funding all these campaigns for for gay marriage and as far as i know nobody had ever thought of gay marriage before it was like you know most most gay couples they just lived together and you know took it as read that you know you can't get a marriage license they never they never even had the idea but they sparked the idea of gay marriage for the election and so about six months before the election it suddenly became a huge issue and huge re reaction and, and they it, they did it deliberately just to consolidate the, the vote on the right so that's the kind of thing you need to do you you just you just think up these hot button contentious <laughs> things like that um and and then do do a bit of road testing on them and then really you you try and you know get them started with fake news essentially well yeah looking for this guy's name <coughs> Well, it's just a kind of an example of uh, the the kind of thing that they have done in the past. I mean, it means um, I think it really means a lot in, in terms of thinking what what the narrative is, um, right. and and then you know try trying to get a visceral reaction. But in general, they just go for the most visceral reactions and make make a story, weave a story around it. But what is very important in what you said, Hugh, is um, to start with a small amount of people and not try to gather numbers in, around a project like this because it's the opposite that we, you know, it's, that's what they are doing. Yeah, it, um, it's kind of a quality versus quantity thing. A, a small group of people that are strongly aligned in one direction. Um, are with armies of people that are misaligned you, you you know you can't really do much with uh, a large group of misaligned interests so but you you can grow a small group of people that are like-minded so it's kind of, it's kind of like gdr and and stuff like that you you can uh, they become a center of attraction for people that are aligned um in that that way of thinking Carl Rove, that's who we're that's thinking the one. of. That's the one. Finally, oh, I got Rove. his name. Yeah. Uh, yes, it was Carl, Carl Rove. Rove. He was absolutely but, the power behind the throne. Yeah, but if you Carl Rove was doing psyops, so yeah. they, they call it dirty tricks, and but it's really uh, such. It's it's standard military techniques that the CIA would do to foreign governments in foreign elections. <laughs> he was just doing it at home. But yeah, so all of these guys um, are worth studying, from Bernays to Karl Rove and and all of these guys. But um, yeah, it, um, in essence, the uh, another good thing to to study if you are into this path is um, if you look at the grifters, the old guys that did long cons especially yeah. in the great age of, of grifting like in the turn of the century and that. i think the some guys like the yellow kid and stuff and these guys they, they were brilliant brilliant psychologists um and in a lot of ways they those guys are misunderstood there's something they weren't as out for the money as most people assume that a lot of the grifters, they kind of thought of themselves as kind of missionaries, as kind of uh, missionaries of God in a way, uh, kind of dark missionaries of God. And their, their base tenant was, you cannot crook an honest man. They mm -hmm. said, there's no way you can pull a, a con on an honest man. So they said that they're doing God's work because they're getting dishonest people and giving them a lesson taking a small profit on the side right. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but but they almost had some of them uh the really really good ones that never got caught i don't think the year the uh, is that the yellow kid I, I can't remember some of those great ones you know uh, cagliostri type con artists they they operated on quite a lot of different levels some of them were freemasons and they would put freemasonry into practice um, but 
they they are worth studying too, just the, their techniques and their psychology. But I, none of those guys, I don't think, the real masters, I don't think they spent a day in prison. They never caught those guys. <laughs> they, they took fantastic fortunes. So the aim is, uh, you know, that kind of that kind of psyops um, in essence. And yeah, it, it, it kind of, it's the reason why I warm to it and why it's so much my territory, although it seems strange to me, is that uh, I had my most formative years in a cult when I was growing up. And it, I, it's not a good or bad thing. It was, um, you know, very formative, um, but I, I came out of that cult absolutely convinced that everything was a cult. <laughs> and went into an American corporation. I couldn't tell the difference. I was like, okay. so like, this is a cult. I'll tell you all the techniques. You're using them in, in, a, in you know, management techniques and employee indoctrination and stuff. And then America is a cult. The flag is a cult. The whole American. And so once you realize that, I thought, well, you know, this is territory I really understand. <laughs> So yeah, my my aim is to just develop it as as far as possible. Um, you know, just building up and being opportunistic. But that's that's what I'm doing. Well, I'm I think it's fabulous, and I'm super intrigued. So keep me updated. <laughs> if there's anything we can do to help, let me know. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, the, that is. Yeah, I mean, I can think of a million things, but in, in essence, just the writing skills and things like that. But do you have a project for a next book? Because I'm, I'm not kidding that you, we really do need something about geoengineering. Soon. Yeah, I mean, we've already got a list of books we need to write, but I agree with you. Geoengineering is absolutely terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying. It's, it's so. coming up fast. I know. Building up. Yeah. They just they could re just wreck everything. They could just wreck. I, I, I don't even know how it's a consideration. That's well, maybe we should start from there, because uh, there's a, you know, that could backfire very, very badly. On yes, it, it will. It will. No, no, I mean not in terms of actually implementing it and having a, a, you know, a physical disaster. I mean, psychologically, it could backfire because okay. it's it's one of those things that really is beyond the pale. So mm -hmm. it seems to me that. If you take that as some of, you can get a bit, very big visceral reaction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. a very good starting point to, to weave a story that's a, around geoengineering. Well, geo, geoengineering is based on, on, on our civilization, uh, industrial civilization. And we all in our group uh, calling for deindustrialization for as long as we started to meet together. And the two things are in, completely li linked. You cannot. Yeah. You cannot have geoengineering in a wrecked um, industrial military civilization. So it, we, we're going back to the thing we were talking at the start. Do you know? Um, mm. Yeah, you kind of build up to that. You kind of build up to a wrecking campaign. But you see, it's it's very easy to bring industrial civilization to a stop if the average person is against it. Right. So it, it needs day by day collaboration by almost everybody involved. You, if you get a defection of one in 20, it's unworkable. Global civilization would stop because mm -hmm. it, it can't work with one in 20 people wrecking it. It's in the Soviet Union, the, the, the biggest danger, especially in the Stalinist period, the, the thing that terrified them most of all was wreckers. And uh, wreckers are just basically people that monkey wrenched, you know, the machinery and stuff in the Soviet Union. And so, yeah, the, why that was such, um, why they were so terrified of wreckers is they were virtually impossible to stop or, or find or prosecute. And it became its, its own, you know, the, what, rec what made wrecking so powerful is it, is it used the paranoia of the establishment against itself. Right. So that after a while, people would look at the, their own, you know, just, you know, screw ups happen, but naturally, but then it, 
their paranoia would think it screwed up because it, there were wreckers <laughs> and eventually they could find wreckers everywhere. The more they prosecuted wreckers, the more they brought people over to the, the other side and made them disillusioned. It fed on itself remarkably. So, so wrecking is, uh, and stealth wrecking uh, is tremendously powerful. So if you imagine a kind of a group, say uh, like Freemasons or something like that, that have come, They've infiltrated everything, and then you know they have the same mindset. They have the same mindset that this all needs to be taken down. They're all clear on the how. Uh, they need to recruit very few people to basically bring everything to a stop. And that's that's the general principle. <laughs> mm. How long have all of you been meeting? Like, how do you all know each other? Um, we we found each other online. So yeah, so I I I've been working on this project since 2012. I spent a, a long time. I, I kind of went off on a path that I, I was unnecessary. I kind of misunderstood the components that you would need for an alternate reality game. But I I launched the my alternative reality game in in 2018. And that was the first time I I started in social media. I avoid, avoided social media like the plague before then. <laughs> right. um, and but I got a bad education from you know going into social media in 2018. I didn't realize how far gone everybody was. I, I was very naive about where people's heads were at, yeah. and I got a do dose of salts when I first went online. I, and and really, after that, I, I decided, well, we, we're too screwed. Because if it's a psychological problem, the average person's head is so far behind where the ecological destruction is, is we, we, I can't see it flipping. Uh, you know, it's, it's just to have a mass psychological change. It doesn't seem very hopeful. I, I mean, I think the climate tipping points might have passed last year. If they haven't passed, we, they, they, they're going to pass you know, very soon. And and then we, we're in we're in bad trouble. Mm -hmm. So we are, yep. yeah, we've yeah. been basically talking about as a group, uh, all of us for about a year, you know, maybe a bit more. And all this is we we're putting things, we're doing all sorts of things. We're talking about all sorts of subjects. We're just laying bases, and Hugh is teaching us a lot of things. And so well, we've been meeting once a week for about a soon a year, isn't it, Mike? That you start you started the recordings yeah. in June. Or May or June, but we started having the meetings in at the first lockdown. Uh, yeah. We were starting to to meet. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've been trying to um, uh, movement jack uh, extinction rebellion because extinction rebellion is is on the left and uh, English, and uh, you know a lot of nice smart, <laughs> smart people. They 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 very very hard work because they they just too nice. And they don't. They don't really believe that there is a catastrophe. Half of them believe there is a catastrophe, and half of them don't. But what what I saw in Extinction Rebellion was I read the tea leaves, and I thought, okay, I'll give them a couple of years, and they will crater. In which case, there'll be a crop of disaffected people <laughs> that can right. recruit. And it, that's turned out pretty accurate. I did a I did a video right when they started, where I read them the future. And so, and I got I got pilloried for it, and then recently people have come back and said you were absolutely right. And I said yeah um, okay. <laughs> and now you're gonna start listening to me. <laughs> but I um I peck away at, at them all the time. And one thing I think that would be really good to do is 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 the one thing the left uh, is, has a very bad deficit on is is the financial. They don't understand the importance of economics and finance. So in, in some ways, it's hard to exaggerate the financial part of it. But the, the system relies on finance. You could, it, it, in, some, in some ways, it's better to see the whole landscape. It's not in terms of ecology, not in terms of climate mitigation, or uh, any, any one of the green initiatives. Is, is, you should just think of it in terms of, of economics. And people on the left, they go to the social sciences and they go and study ecology and stuff like that. 
And so they have a complete blank spot uh, about the markets and how the financial system works, which is the essence of the problem. And that's really the target, you know. So, so they don't have the kryptonite. And it's very difficult to explain economics to them and stuff, <laughs> even, though, even though I've tried. But the economic system is very, very vulnerable. And there again, uh, you know, the recent big successes, and that's like Wall Street bets have, have started to show people, oh, yeah, maybe this, <laughs> maybe the ants can take it down this elephant. But I, I the Extinction Rebellion is starting to do a dead strike and rent strike. I've been hounding them to try and do a debt strike and rent strike because that that could really take off and be really devastating to the system. And they, they're doing it now. They, they need guidance. They just don't have the knowledge what to do. And unfortunately, they, they're not inclined to listen. <laughs> it's like, you know, le liberal activists are have a strong dash of narcissistic egotism and so they're very good at listening to their own story but right. they won't take advice from anybody <laughs> and so yeah so they're difficult to help but yeah that's that's i put a lot of focus into extinction rebellion and peck away at them my next uh, my next target is uh, i, I want to carry on pecking away at roger hallam he's uh, he's distracted now with the london mayoral election he started up a new party called burning pink and he has this fixation on politics when if i could if i could wave a wand and change the left in one way it would be forget politics and politicians they are useless they are not the bear you think they are you're barking up the wrong tree they don't have any power see if the if the left knew about the financial system they'd know that the right. politicians are, are just vassals they're just puppets yeah yep. so, so ignore them you know you're going to cop 26 and protesting is like you're completely barking up the wrong tree so so but as soon as uh, roger halliman is finished with the mayoral election then then i i they promised me I, I can get an hour of his time and i'll try and try and convince him of some of this kind of stuff but uh, yeah that's that's uh, the, the essence of the plan, but um, yeah. We're, would you mind just, just looking at the video as much as you can take of the three hours? Oh just... no, that sounds absolutely fascinating. I'm, yeah, just just tell me how to find it or send me a link. Yeah, I'll, I'll send, we'll send a link. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. But, well, okay. Does anybody have any more to say on that? I was like... I think I think we should yeah I think we should look at that three hour video that you did <laughs> because it's you no know, but your comments um, the way you've constructed the video are kind of for people who don't know what we're talking about it's kind of just really laying the basis and the foundation of most of our talks around the arc and and that illustrates perfectly the the, the psyops that's that's uh, that they're using the Q psyops. Uh, and you can you can just change the names and see what we would sure. like to do, and then we can maybe reconvene and we can okay. go a bit further. I mean, you know, sure. Yeah, I, I, instead of thinking in terms of what you can do for us, um, think in terms of what we can do for like GDR and and you guys. We need everybody to read our book. <laughs> yeah. Oh, definitely. Buy that. Book. Yes. Give us money. We need money. We're desperate. Well, well, okay. Well, there's there's an interesting thing too. <laughs> well, maybe I should. Have you got much more time? Because you you mentioned just a few minutes. I gotta go soon. But yeah, okay. go ahead. One more thought. Let's have uh, it. When I started on on this arg, I thought that the money the money is the difficult part. And what I realized was uh, what a lot of people didn't realize. They thought that an arg took money, and and I realized. Hang on. This could be self-funding. Funding. There's so many ways to monetize an alternate reality game. That's, uh, so I started from that point of view, and I started from the point of view of making an alternative currency to run the game, which makes it a lot better than e-begging and right. asking yeah, for yeah, cash. Yeah. <laughs> you, you run the game with, with the fake currency. Um, I mean, kind of a, the anti-Bitcoin, in, in other words. Yeah, now, yeah. I've, heard, I've definitely heard of this part of it. Like there's other games where they do this. 
Yeah, it's in, in essence, it's kind of tickets and Chuck E. Cheese, you know, yeah, basically, yeah, yeah. you just, you you earn, well, I made this currency called Geo Dollars. And so you, you earn Geo Dollars, and then you can use them in the game. And, and there are ways of monetizing them, you know, just by getting, you know, real world fiat currency out of it in a, in a not in your face kind of way. So it's not, uh, you see, one thing that can really turn people off from an argument if it looks like it's done for commercial reasons. And that's what people are on the, they have their antennas up for yeah, oh, this sure. is just a money making scheme and stuff, but it's not, it's just using, it's accepting the reality that everybody in the game needs money. So my idea is that we're all of the same mindset and we, I'm not rich, I, uh, so I, I need funding. But my idea is that everybody in the game, you know, supports themselves to in a modest extent, like we, you know, we're not, we're not of the mindset that we, we, we had in this. Um, and then we return the money to the game to, to expand it and grow it organically. But the idea is that everybody participates, especially the, the early incumbents, would I would be able to live off the game, and so uh, I so I spent I spent five years writing the software and the stuff for the alternate currency. Then then realized oh you've really gone all in with this. <laughs> yeah, because I I realized in 2012. I mean, I've been trying for my whole life. Really, I've been <laughs> been an anarchist, but I I. I I tried everything. I tried to beat the system from the inside. I tried to make a, a green company in 2000. I tried to make an employee-owned company. I, I exhausted every every avenue, and every everything taught me that it's all psychology. That you can't you can't approach it from a technological point of view. I tried everything from uh, you know glass initiatives and you know, getting technology for recycling and alternative energy. And I mean, in the, tw you know, in the 2000s and trying to get an innovative company and trying to, you know, bring down the financial system by having, you know, a successful model for a company. So I've been bootstrapping green companies before that was in vogue. Um, but it all always came down. It always taught me that the guy, you know, it's the, the psychology of the people is not ready for it. It's, uh, the way I say it is, you, you know, you can take the slave out of the plantation. Right. You can't take the plantation out of the slave. Right, right. And that's it. So what I realized was you've got to get the plantation out of the slave. That's the main thing. Then releasing the slave from the plantation is easy. But, yeah, m my thinking since 2012 is that the way to do it is with um, an alternate reality game. And it just so happens that alternative reality game is something I know very well, which is a cult. <laughs> right. Well, this is clearly you were born to this, so. Yeah, I do feel yeah. a bit that way. But well, it, I get it. Yeah. But it's, yeah, I, I, I'm a terribly a terrible doomer. I, I do think it's, it's a bit too late. But I'm, I'm kind of with Michael Mann and the, in the way he's thinking, like, well. You know, there are levels of being screwed, and there are you know even if it's too late, if we passed all the climate tipping points, and even if we go extinct, there are various ways this movie can end, and some are a lot worse than others. And what yeah. I feel is we're on a trajectory for a very very bad movie, yeah. and you know you could almost anything is better than what we're on, so you can almost do no wrong. Is what I feel. Yeah, very true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, send me the link to your um, your breakdown of the TED Talk. I will take a look because I do All find right. this very intriguing. Um, and I should probably go because I got to be somewhere else. But okay, well, thank to you. Talk to you all again. It's yeah. just it's yeah. a lot of fun. I mean, you definitely get my head spinning. So well, we'll do we'll do our best to uh, read and promote your book. Very good. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> all right. Well, we'll talk Thanks. again soon. Okay. Right. Thank, thank you. Very nice to see you. Okay, bye. Bye, guys. See bye. you later. See you soon. Bye.